you. We have Kendra Wiley over here, our legislative director, Melissa, a little page for our communications director, Tom Shaw, our deputy uh, chief of staff, Carlos, Sam, Oliver, our owl in the foyer. Uh, they are our uh, constituent service coordinators for different sections of the board. I'm also happy to share that we have been joined by our super dynamic uh, council budget office team. We have our council budget director, uh, Jim Rudolph, as well as uh, Ann Phelps, who is the uh, budget council. Um, and they will walk us through the particulars of the budget, how it works, and things you should know so we can leverage as much as possible this opportunity to get as much as we can for Ward 5 residents. So with that, I'm going to move us along. Here is our agenda for today. Uh, we might be flexible with some of these sections, but this will outline generally how we're going to flow through today's session. Uh, for the welcome, uh, we are engaging in that now, uh, followed uh, by my remarks, uh, Ann and Jen will share. Uh, we will have some icebreakers uh, talk about some challenges and opportunities um, and get your input on uh, how you would want us to allocate uh, funds in this up upcoming budget cycle. If you have not already, we highly encourage you to take advantage of our uh, budget survey. Uh, we have paper copies as well as you can scan the code here with your phone. To complete it, we want a formal record. Today is super helpful, and so everything that we discuss will be formally recorded. We are live streaming this as well. So if you are watching uh, virtually, we encourage you to also complete the survey. But this allows us to uh, better document your uh, nuanced perspectives. Um, and so to give you an example, uh, you may say, uh, we want to better invest in our rec facilities in Ward 5. Uh, however, on this survey, you can better document that we actually want to make sure um, that the, the gym equipment at our rec facilities at Turkey Thicket, for instance, is uh, maintained better. So again, just a quick plug for the budget survey, um, and we're going to get started uh, with a few baseline questions for us to uh, know who's in the room. Before we do this, have we gone over the Mentimeter uh, particulars? No. So uh, if you, uh, Melissa, if you, I could ask you to come up and just kind of briefly describe how we're going to use the Mentimeter. This is going to be an interactive session for us to engage with you. Uh, Melissa will walk us through, and then we have some questions for you. Good morning. Um, in order to really foster a space of interaction and also a way that we can record all of that interaction, we'd love for you to use Menti with us this morning. The way to do that is by going to the browser on your phone and going to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and entering the code you see at the top of the screen. It's small, so I will say it out loud a few times. It's five seven six three four zero one three five seven six three four zero one and that prompt at the top of the screen will remain there the entire slide presentation so if for some reason you navigate away from it um, that reminder will always be at the top of the slides. But by going to menti.com, entering that code, you'll be able to follow along with the slides directly on your phone and also interact for the slides where we have question prompts or like this one where we're asking where you live in Word 5. Um, so we do invite you to try and select on the map here where you live in Word 5. Um, the map is small and your fingers are probably bigger than, than the precise location of your home, but we'd love to see um, where folks are and more time and how they're joining us. This uh, using Menti will also allow uh, folks who are joining us on YouTube to participate. There is a pinned comment in the YouTube chat um, directing you to use Mentimeter, so this will allow us to participate both in this room and in And as you can see, as you're Completing that, it's interacting in real time. Yeah. So you can join again at menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. You will enter the code 5763-4013. If you are having issues, 
raise your hand and a member of our team can come to assist you. That's a small call that you really can't figure out. Oh, this is good. <laughs> yes, we All right, we're not going to belabor the point, but uh, we hope that you will engage with us uh, as we go through the session. It will be really important because we do have questions built in here, um, and we'll be asking you to use Mentee. Uh, so uh, let's keep going for the sake of time. We are also asking you to share your age group. And this helps us determine how requests are broken down by various age groups for residents across the world. Yes. Um, the code is five seven six three four zero one three. It's at the top of the screen here. Don't no worry. All right. Thank you. Uh, we're going to keep going. A few more questions. How long have you lived in Ward Five? We know the district and our ward is changing rapidly and has changed drastically. And so we want to get a sense of how long residents who are sharing their perspectives have lived in the world. We're tracking our own progress here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to venture to guess who the two 30 plus uh, year <laughs> residents might be. Awesome. Thank you. And then I believe we have one more question. What do you love most about living in Ward 5? And there are so many things. If you are just joining us by walking in the room, we are using Minty Meter. Uh, you can join by visiting minty.com and using the code at the top of the screen, Smart Park to see community as one of the largest words on the screen. I completely agree. Keep them coming. Of the words that jump out, the location, Ward 5 is the best word. It's the walkability of our community, uh, the history, the beauty, the dynamic, child care, the people always changing, lifers, uh, the National Arboretum, family oriented, uh, my neighbors, people. As you can see, there's so much to love about our community. And the reason why we are vigorously advocating for as many resources as we can through this budget process is because um, we love our community. So thank you again for engaging in this process. So how do you best engage with the council, our office in this budget process? Uh, we encourage you to start early. Um, that is why it is uh, February and we are engaging and kicking off this formal process. Uh, the mayor and her executive agencies are actively uh, uh, developing their budget. Um, and so one way you can always reach out to the mayor's team and or respective uh, agencies to share your concerns, uh, engage offices in addition to ours. Uh, like we're kicking this process off. This is the beginning of a conversation, not the end, uh, but making sure that you document formally your requests uh, be direct and specific. I gave an example earlier. Instead of saying better funding for our rec centers, uh, saying something like funding the gym equipment at Turkey Picket, uh, being direct and specific, uh, and don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Uh, budgets are not only moral documents, in my opinion, but they are comprised of many competing interests. Uh, and so sometimes there may be compromises and or trade-offs. And so it is important to keep in mind uh, that we may not get everything we want, 
Uh, and sometimes uh, an investment may be good enough, uh, although it may not be exactly what you would desire. So a few more slides and then we're gonna turn it over to our uh, council budget staff. But I wanted to highlight some of the top line challenges and opportunities for the district as I see it. Um, um, and there are many. You may have heard up until this point, uh, this year's budget process will be unlike uh, any that we've seen in recent times, in part because of the financial pressures facing the district. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, but also there is a, 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 I don't want to say level of uncertainty, uh, but there are, are uh, questions around how those challenges may manifest in the years to come, I'll put it that way. Uh, so here are a few opportunities and challenges. Uh, we have an opportunity to enact a child tax credit. I am super proud to have introduced this legislation. It was actually one of the first pieces of major legislation I introduced last year. Um, and the reason why this is so significant is because uh, we have data around the effectiveness of a child tax credit program. When the federal government expanded uh, the child tax credit nationally, it slashed child poverty rates in half. It, and in fact, it is the single most effective anti-poverty program this country has implemented in more than 50 years. Uh, that federal child tax credit sunsetted several years ago, although now the federal government is in talks about re-implementing or reinstituting a child tax credit, which is really exciting. What this policy proposal suggests is we have an opportunity to implement a child tax credit in the District of Columbia. Super exciting, both because it will raise the economic floor for families, but also it will slash child poverty rates. Much of what we're seeing play out in our city, whether it's about violence, uh, school performance, uh, engagement, job opportunity, and readiness connects directly, I think, uh, to uh, family socioeconomic status. And so uh, this is a great tool for us to reassure, uh, reassure uh, and support our families. A few things about the particulars. When I introduced the legislation, it called for a $500 investment for families, for children ages 17 and under, uh, for up to three children. Uh, the Child uh, or the Tax Revision Commission uh, supports a child tax credit and not only supports it, but they are calling for us to expand on my initial proposal, which now I'm supporting their proposal. Uh, and their proposal is a $1,000 credit for uh, any children, uh, for families uh, with children 17 and under. Um, and there's um, negotiating that is needed for income bans. Uh, suffice it to say, we are looking to include low-income and middle-income families with individual incomes anywhere from about $150,000 and low, lower for individuals and upwards of $200,000 for joint filers. And so as you can see, this would include a large swath of families in the district, which is important. Now, for those that would say, why are we giving an individual uh, or a family making over $200,000 a child tax credit? Uh, I like to think of it as uh, a teacher who may be married to a firefighter uh, and they happen to have children. Uh, in a district context, uh, by no means are they ultra wealthy, uh, and I believe they too should be supported. Uh, and we have evidence to suggest that uh, the program would pay greater dividends if we include middle income families. So, great opportunity here. I welcome your support as we move through this uh, budget process. Uh, we recently had a council oversight uh, uh, hearing on the bill, uh, which was super successful. Um, and I will be pushing for us to fund and enact the child tax credit this year. All right, next slide. So we have a question for you. If you had to fund the child tax credit, where would we get the money? Where would you raise the needed revenue? There are many opportunities. I'm not going to tip the skills. I will color in it after you give some suggestions. But how might we think about funding this type of program? And I did give you a dollar amount. My initial proposal, uh, which called for $500 investment for up to three children, uh, will cost roughly $30 million, which is a huge price tag. 
the Tax Revision Commission's proposal, which calls for a thousand dollar proposal for any amount of children, 17 and under, would be about 70 million dollars. Again, a hefty price tag. Uh, but I think if you look at um, the effects and the impact of this type of policy, um, is what we're so how should we pay for it? Jen and Ann don't know yet, but I'll be looking to them for, to help us fund this program this year. Um, but some of the things I'm seeing, uh, lottery and income tax for people making above $250,000, make developers pay, budget cuts to the police, entertainment and uh, tourism, raise taxes, uh, a weed tax, uh, tax the wealthy, property tax, mansion tax. Uh, so I'm seeing taxes as well as uh, falling on those who earn a lot to pay uh, to help pay for this type of thing. So this is helpful, uh, and we will keep those uh, proposals in mind. But again, Jen and Ann uh, will help us figure out how we're going to pay for this. Um, second, addressing the modest budget shortfall. You all have heard a lot about this, uh, but the headline here is that Ramada had about a 700 or as about a $750 million budget hold. Um, and that has caused the region, including Maryland, Virginia, and the district, uh, to come to the table and think about how are we going to keep WMATA afloat? And the reason why that is so important is because not only would it um, devastate our city in terms of access and transportation, it would undermine our ability to rebuild our downtown corridor and a lot of the efforts that we are engaging in to uh, keep our tax base afloat. Um, WMATA went to the, within their books and said, all right, we're gonna find some efficiencies and ways that we can cut internally. Uh, we're gonna shave that number down. Um, and uh, the District of Maryland and Virginia are currently in debates around how we're going to address this. You may have seen the mayor uh, and the chairman and um, council member Allen, who chairs the council's transportation and environment committee, which I'm a member of, uh, put out a formal letter saying the district offers $200 million towards this budget shortfall. That letter also said we will not commit to a multi-year uh, commitment. This is a one-year commitment for $200 million, and we need to revisit how we're going to pay for this in future years, um, and they said a host of other things. I think that proposal is uh, fair and generous, and it calls on Maryland and Virginia and Nevada uh, to come to the table to do their fair share for us to plug this gap. Um, one last thing I would just say, uh, there has been a lot of talk about a tax. It is my thinking if we impose a tax to Club this uh, budget shortfall. It should be a regional tax, not one just imposed on district residents. And I don't support this, the district just picking up the slack uh, if Maryland and or Virginia don't pay their budget. So more to come here. Uh, these are active negotiations, uh, and this is a major issue facing the district. How are we going to keep a model afloat, uh, both for access and transportation for our residents, but to support our efforts to build back downtown? And everything we're trying to do. So uh, we have a question, an engagement question for you. Please rank the following options for funding the model long term. Um, and you'll see uh, there are four options. I'm going to ask that you rank them in order of your preference. First being your number one preference, fourth being your last the least uh, preferred option. For those that might not be able to see. Uh, one is a regional tax that captures the value of transit adjacent land. The second is uh, road pricing to ease congestion and improve public health. Um, another is cutting essential government services and assistance. And another is a sales tax that uh, places disproportionately higher burdens on poor residents.
All right, keep it coming. Um, but it seems like if we can go back just one second, the, the most preferred option here is a regional tax. Maybe I took some skills there, but I share my opinion. Uh, but again, um, if this is a regional transit system, we should be uh, finding regional solutions. So that is the head. All right, one more slide. Uh, violence and public safety. This is top of mind for all of us. In Ward 5, we felt the impact of violence uh, very acutely, and um, it underscores everything that we're doing during this budget season. Um, I would say on Tuesday, the council will be taking up uh, its first vote on the Security C Omnibus Bill. Um, and I know there's been a lot of discussion, feedback, rhetoric about public safety in our proposals. Uh, and so I invite you to continue to engage with our office and share your concerns. Uh, public safety has been top of mind for me and my office since the very first week. Uh, that I was in the office. You remember the first week I was in the office, uh, Ron Blake uh, was killed in Brooklyn. And since we have hosted over two dozen uh, community walks and meetings, we have worked to set up a monthly public safety call. Uh, and the goal of that is to both educate neighbors but also coordinate across government. I've introduced several pieces of legislation, uh, several of which are included in the Security C omnibus proposal. Um, and I have been working hand in hand with our public safety apparatus, uh, most closely with uh, 5D Commander Altieri, uh, to address what is happening. Uh, good news is we are seeing positive trends in terms of violence trending downward uh, so far in 2024. Uh, this past week, we had a mayor council breakfast, and both our year to date and our monthly. Our numbers suggest that violent crime in the district is going down. I think that yesterday I looked and we are seeing a 50% drop in homicides uh, for yesterday's day compared to what would that have been, February 2nd last year. Um, that does not mean uh, violence is not still rampant. It does not mean we don't need to continue to find solutions, but it does mean that uh, there may be light at the end of the tunnel and we need to keep finding solutions that are going to pay off. All that to say, uh, there are questions around how do we use our budget to reinforce our public safety apparatus and continue to double down on things that will actually work. Uh, so a question I have for you is, if you had $100, how would you spend it to support public safety in the district? Options here include additional MPD officers and detectives, more violence interrupters, youth employment and recreation, housing and food assistance, cameras and theft prevention devices, behavioral health and addiction treatment. All right, keep it coming. Uh, but based on initial responses, it seems the majority of people would allocate the majority of their resources for behavioral health and addiction treatments, then housing and food assistance, and then youth employment and recreation, and so on and so forth. This does not mean that um, one of these factors are more important than others. How I see it is some of these are reactive solutions versus proactive solutions. Um, and I'm heartened to see that addressing the root causes of why someone might pick up a gun or it's carjack someone is how our community is thinking about approaching the budget process with greater investments in behavioral health and addiction treatment and housing and food assistance. I'm gonna call uh, Jen and Ann up, but they're gonna lead us in our next section. Uh, but a few uh, policy related things uh, as it relates here. You may have heard a lot of talk about give snap or raise um, and I want to bring this up as this is highlighted here. Uh, we did win that fight by we meaning the council. Uh, during the height of the pandemic, uh, the federal government uh, gave um, 
a greater uh, enhanced subsidy to SNAP recipients. Uh, what we know from data is that the average SNAP recipient exhausts their money monthly allotment within the first two weeks of the month, uh, which means for the last two weeks, they're cutting corners and making ends meet, just trying to put food on the table. At the height of the pandemic, um, families receive an additional allotment based on the size of their household. Uh, that sunset it uh, with a host of other things, including the child tax credit. Um, and so the gift a SNAP raise was the, our local government saying, we are going to enhance and greater support families receiving SNAP benefits, knowing uh, that food is higher and cost more, and knowing that many of our families are exhausting their benefits before the end of the month. Uh, it, it was voted on, it was funded, um, and it was funded by uh, a trigger embedded within the budget, um, and the mayor signed it into law. Fast forward, the mayor then said, we're not going to implement it, and we're not going to do this. Fast forward, uh, the council uh, and other organizations threatened to sue, we did not sue, threatened to sue, uh, and the council took up uh, legislation that would authorize uh, the council's council uh, to pursue a lawsuit if, it, if that was necessary. The mayor ultimately reversed this. Um, all that to say, uh, starting at the end of this month or next month, uh, families in the district receiving SNAP benefits will start seeing those enhanced uh, investments. And I'm really proud of that. It aligns with what we're saying here, housing and food assistance. Uh, it is not to excuse the violence that we're seeing in the city, but we need to do a better job of addressing the root causes of why anybody would want to run and do a harm. So with that, uh, I want to introduce again our uh, dynamic points of budget team, uh, led by Budget Director Jim Rudolph uh, and Ann Phillips. So, welcome. Them. Dynamic is a little uh, I'm nervous because it's Saturday morning. I don't know how dynamic I am with no coffee. Right. Can you hear me? Yes. Do you want to speak? Thank you for having us. We're glad to be back. Well, we were here last year, I believe. And uh, again, I'm Jen Rudolph. I am the budget director for the council. And Phelps, I'm the budget lawyer for the council's budget office. Yes. So, uh, what we want to do is just have a we. A brief conversation on what the budget is, the types of money that we spend, all sort of points of information that will help you become a better budget advocate for what you want to see in Ward 5 and throughout the city. Uh, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about the process itself, so you know the key dates, and then we'll open it up for questions. So first, what is the budget? <laughs> the budget is the district's spending plan. And it dictates what we're spending our money on and what type of money we're using to pay for that spending. Now this, we're going to bring in. Oh, so we do. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in the district's budget, we have two distinct areas, two distinct types of spending. The operating budget, which is how we pay for our people, contracts, pencils, things, lots of pencils, not so much anymore. Um, and then, and that is by far the largest portion of the district's budget. The FY24 operating budget is $19.8 billion. It's a lot. Um, and then we have our capital budget. Our capital budget is how we pay for our buildings. We pay for this beautiful um, UDC campus, uh, the beautiful library down the street, the schools, the roads, and things like that. There are two different, and that budget is $2.4 million. And by and large, we can't shift from one to the other. But when, when Jen says they're distinct buckets, those buckets Everything spending in capital stays pretty much in capital. So 
a lot of times during the budget process, people say, why are we spending so much money on some capital project? Why can't we invest that somewhere else? And the reason is the types of money and the, the ways those can be spent are limited to those kind of capital projects. It's not fungible between projects. Because for the most part, for our capital budget, we borrow money, we go to the bond market, we borrow, it takes between 20 and 30 years to pay that back. So you want the length or the duration of that consent to match the type of funding. Um, you know, we don't want to borrow money and pay somebody's salary and then have to pay back that for 20 or 30 years. So it's really a lot, I mean, for folks who've ever owned a home, it's really the difference between paying cash for something or having a mortgage, right? So you're, I guess some people, Cash. Not so this is this is my favorite chart <laughs> and i really like this chart because it um it shows the total picture of how much money the district spends uh, on an annual basis and when you look at it you know you get you know people say the budget is a moral document um, but I think this really gives us a good sense of how um, how the district spends its money, what our priorities are, and um, and it is a good representation of the fact that we invest our funds in the just in in what the priorities are for the the, the citizens of the district of Columbia. So I don't know how much I don't know if you can read from far back if you can see when some of these are. So we'll go through sort of the top, right? So the very top one is the Department of Healthcare Finance. Uh, that is, um, it is what it's showing at just shy of four point five billion, and the vast majority of those funds are federal funds. But what does that represent? That represents home care. It represents Medicaid. Um, we forty percent of district residents um, take advantage of Medicaid. We have the uh, most generous Medicaid program in the country. Um, it's something that we're very, we're, we're very invested in. Uh, we also have our alliance program too for um, district residents that can't qualify for Medicaid. And as we all know, healthcare is very expensive, but it's something that, mm -hmm. um, yes. Uh, the next two are schools. <clears throat> the first at the top is District of Columbia Public Schools, right below it is charter schools. Now the green part represents the operating budget. And it's, I find it interesting that, you know, at this point, you know, about half of our children go to public schools, half of our children go to charter schools. And that's represented here by roughly the same amount of operating money going to each sector. The purple part is the capital budget, and it's what we spend every year to improve our schools. Um, and, uh, you know, we spend, Four hundred, five hundred million dollars a year in one school improvement. Next, repayment of loans and interest. What's this? This is the debt service. This is how we pay back all of the borrowing that we take out to pay for our roads and schools and libraries and UDC campuses. Yes. Um, next, Department of Transportation. You see that's primarily purple. So that's the capital that we spend on our roads, sidewalks, alleys. After that, um, C, which is the office of the state superintendent of education, that is the sort of state education agency that oversees public schools and charter schools. And a lot of the a lot of the spending that you see on programs that are run by our schools go through Aussie, so uh, out of school time, and I mean, there's a million of them, but a lot of the spending that happens goes through Aussie. Right, and a, lot of the, really and a lot of the federal funding that ends up at our schools starts at the city. Um, and then the Department of Human Services, so on and so forth. So anyways, I mean, I just, 
I like this chart because it it, it has it shows a full representation of, of what we spend our money on. It. Because there's always a lot of discussion about where our money is going, and I think um, a lot of it focuses on things that are actually further down the list. And the district has invested for years in uh, healthcare and education. And those are um, those are our primary sort of expenditure drivers. Again, this is just a visual representation of the operating budget. The main takeaway from this is um, the purple. Yeah, human support services and public education make up more than half of the money that we spend in the district. And again, this is the capital budget just to show about a third our roads, WMATA, things like that. About a quarter public education system. That's our schools, our libraries, UDC, things like that. So that is what we spend uh, the district's capital on. Yes. So, uh, this is a slide I think Connor put together, which I kind of love because one of my jobs is tracking legislation that has a cost. So when the district passes legislation that has a fiscal impact, the legislation is subject to funding or subject to appropriation. And so it can't be implemented until it's funded. And so that's another thing. So I'm, if it's okay, I'm going to occasionally editorialize up here because I can't help myself. So, um, Sometimes I'll see in um, different reports, press reports, or coverage, you know, oh, the council's always passing legislation that costs money. Why do they do that? Well, we can only fund legislation during the budget. The council can only allocate funds during the budget process. But if we waited until the budget process to pass legislation, we wouldn't pass any because the budget consumes a lot of the council's time, 90% of it, during the 10 weeks we have it. They only have it for 10 weeks. So we pass legislation through the rest of the year because we want to go through a robust legislative process. We want to have a public hearing. We want to hear from the residents. What do they think? And then we pass the legislation, and then we basically, it's it's not some of it that has a cost. If it has a cost, it's not implemented until funded. And then we use the budget process where we can to fund those bills so that they can go and one of the things we track on our website um, is legislation passed subject to funding. And we release a report every four months, basically, every three months, actually, every three months about where things are at. And I update it every three months so that you can see what's been funded and how. And but it's just a sort of a key piece because the council only has the ability to fund during the budget process. So but examples of this uh, kind of picked a couple of good ones that I think are. Um, things people are interested in. And what happens is when the legislation is passed, the chief financial officer, they have an office that looks at the bill and figures out what it's going to cost. And that fiscal impact is included in our report. So these are just two things, excellent bills, really important things. They have a cost. We'll have to try to figure out if these are two that we'll be able to find. Is that kind of what okay. So I... I didn't come up with a slide. This is another one from the awesome team in uh, Council of Partners office, but I love it because this budget process is, the budget is like one of the most important things that happens, right? Because it funds the government. The mayor has been working on the budget since September. So the budget she's going to deliver in March. And she's finalizing it right now. She's working on it. She has some forums. She drops that budget March 20th, but then it comes to council. And the Home Rule Act says we have we have to pass the budget, have to approve it within 70 days. So we have 10 weeks to look at a $20 billion budget. The, the proposal comes down, the chairman separates out the budget depending on each committee's purview. So the Committee on Transportation and Environment will look at DDOT, and will look at DOE, and will look at all these other agencies within their jurisdiction. Same for each other committee. Each committee holds hearings on those agencies in their purview, 
And then they put together a recommendation to how they would modify the mayor's budget proposal. So they analyze it, they hear from their residents, and then they put together their own proposal. Each committee votes on it. So Councilor Parker, who sits on four committees, that's a lot of reading. So he sits on four committees and he will go to those markups and will before the markups, he'll be working with his colleagues to chair those committees about his priorities in those committees. And they'll propose the committee chair propose a committee markup of that report. All 11 standing committees will do that. And then it gets transferred to the chairman of the council. And Chairman Mendelson will consolidate those 11 budgets. That's our team really works. We help all the committees. Sorry, I'm jumping on because you would have think I had a lot of coffee this morning. But we we help the committees, but it's really that consolidation. We pull all 11 together into one council wide budget. And the chairman, in his direction, filling other priorities that the council members didn't get fulfilled in their committees and council wide priorities that couldn't be filled by us. So we work on that. And the, so 54 days after the mayor drops her budget, we have our first one. And then two weeks later, we have our second. So 70 days, 10 weeks, $20 million, it moves in quick. And this is, this is that timeline we sort of talked about. Start, the fiscal year starts October 1, the mayor and the OCFO start, and it goes all the way to where we are now in February. Um, we just had the um, ACFR release. What's the ACFR? That's the district's uh, annual audit. Uh, 27 consecutive clean audit for the district. Which is a really, it sounds super boring, but it's super cool. cool. Yes. For those of you that remember the control board period, <laughs> when we couldn't yeah. get an audit, yeah. we are very proud of this. Get through this. And also not just have a clean audit, but you know, not you know lots of material weaknesses uh, and things like that. So these are the specific dates, and I think that this presentation will be shared with you later if you want to track these dates. But um, the budget is coming in six and a half weeks. Um, it'll come on Wednesday, and the mayor will present to council. She's done it the last several years at MLK. With a presentation about her highlights, what she considers most important. Um, two days later, there'll be a formal presentation with the chief financial officer, the mayor, and the city administrator. And then starting March 25th, the council committees will have their hearings. We'll be announcing that schedule, hopefully, um, at the Tuesday committee of the whole, but if not, shortly thereafter, and we'll be up on our website. It's up on the council web. It'll, it will be up on the council website where you can sign up for any hearing. You also don't have to come in person. You can um, test, a lot of them are hybrid. You can testify via Zoom. You can submit a written testimony. There are a million ways to have your voices heard. Um, and it's, and, and really the council's hearings page is sort of a one-stop shop and all the information will be in one spot. Questions? Lost track because well, I've lost track because there have been so many, so much back and forth and um, iterations and debates. Um, but to what extent does the budget have to be submitted to the Congress for review uh, versus not? So the Rural Act requires us to submit our budget to Congress for review, but it's passive review, just generally speaking. Um, so we do have local budget autonomy, which means we can pass our budget ourselves. What they, what Congress, the Congress is the ultimate authority because of the Home Rule Act. And so we submit it, it goes through a 30 day passive review process and then it becomes law. Um, which is different from prior to budget autonomy, we were part of one of the uh, 13 appropriations bills and they, Congress has. And they still include us in that, um, but now they reference our local budget act. So it's just at the rates set forth in the local budget. I mean, I try to get the specific language changed all the time. I think this is to me. Yeah, and, and it's um, basically our budget is treated just like any other piece of legislation. Yeah. Yes. 
Um, Carmen, I didn't see the EJ Amendment Act 2023. Is how can we get that funded? And also, um, we are working on. Yeah. Well, it hasn't happened yet, but we're talking about eminent domain for the National Indiana product. How can we implement that into the budget as far as taking over that lane? And also the Aussie bus terminal in Brentwood, how is that getting funded? Short of it, we have to pass the bill first. We introduced it, we need to have a hearing, we have to vote on it, and then we can fund it. Likely, there is a there is an opportunity to pass legislation through the budget, and maybe you all can speak to that. Um, but if that's not the avenue, then we would have to wait for a vote to the vote and then fund it in connection with budget. So budget, the budget is itself a series, <laughs> I mean, several pieces of legislation. Um, there's the local budget act, which is actually the appropriations act. That's with all the numbers, and that's those budget books sort of supplement those numbers in the local budget act. But we also pass a legislative package to support the budget, um, and those are uh, pieces. It's can be ninety. It's a whole bunch of individual pieces of legislation packaged as the budget support act, and um, that that's a way to pass legislation to implement dollars that are included in the budget. Um, it just there's a there's no way to say for sure which way is the best way. Sometimes we like to put the money in the budget, pass the legislation separately, so it has a robust legislative record. So that if there's anything that comes up later, we can go back and look and say, hey, why did we do it this way, or what was the reasoning, and who testified, and what's it about. And uh, as the person who manages the budget support act, I really love the legislative process route, um, not just because the budget support act is big, but because I really care about there being a real record. And when we do it in the budget, the report is very small because it has to be, because when the legislation is anywhere from 150 to 600 pages, it's hard in the 70 days to fill it. It's actually in the 54 days we have to have the report. So I prefer a robust record, but that's you no know, one person. So, well, I was looking at gonna, I have a couple right here. Um, how tight will the budget be compared to past years? So the budget will be tight this year. I would say that the budget is tight every year. Uh, the difference is that we have sort of like a, a bunch of fortuitous events coming together at one time. We have all of the federal uh, COVID money is expiring. So while we have spent it on a lot of worthwhile things, and we have spent it on uh, programs that are not set to continue, there still are a few things that um, we have funded with these COVID dollars. The COVID dollars are going away, and we're going to have to figure out if we're going to continue these programs and fund them with local funds or if they're going to go away. On top of that, we have a sort of like once in a like once in a decade types of things, like Council Member Parker was talking about the market. <clears throat> we are going to be sending uh, an additional 200 million to Wamada this year. Next year it's going to be more. And then the year after it's going to be more. And then while we're dealing with an operating budget flip with Bulana, in two or three years, we're also going to have another capital flip with Bulana. So, um, you know, we're talking about 200 now. In two or three years, it's probably going to be another million. We have um, unexpected increases in our pension funds that we have to fund this year about an extra hundred million dollars. Uh, the district's pensions are fully funded. We are one of the only states that has fully funded pensions. We are very proud of that and we want to make sure that our teachers and firefighters and police officers 
have pensions when they retire and then other states that don't fund their pensions. <laughs> so, um, and that's very expensive. So, we have uh, an unexpected $100 million there. And then, you know, there are things like, um, for example, emergency rental assistance. When we got the budget last year, uh, the mayor proposed like $8.3 million for emergency rental assistance. You know, council members um, heard from residents that that is not nearly enough. And we knew from the spending that we had done um, in previous years that we needed more to like that. So we pulled together $43 million for emergency rental assistance for this current budget year. But we, it's kind of like technical, but we only funded it on a one-time basis because we were worried that if we funded it on a recurring basis, the mayor would just take those funds away and use them for something else. So that's sort of like a typical clip where we had a significant amount of money funded in FY24. Um, it's not reflected in the financial plan. So we're going to need to find, again, another significant amount of money in FY25 to fund uh, emergency rental assistance. So it's, you know, it's sort of like a confluence of events. We have, um, oh, yeah. And, <laughs> and then um, our uh, commercial real estate um, values are uh, going down. Um, when buildings are vacant, um, they are not assessed as highly because the assessment is based on their rentals and those valuations have gone down. And I believe between between 21 and 22, um, commercial real estate values in the district as a whole went down like 9% which is the first time I've ever seen that, and they are continuing to go down. But I do want to say that even though downtown commercial property values are going down, over the past 20 years, the district has diversified our commercial real property to not just be located in downtown. We have so many other areas of the city now like Noma, uh, Navy Yard, the Wharf, um, Union Market, um, Walter Reed, so many places in the city that 20 years ago we didn't have um, high value commercial properties. And now we do have high value commercial properties more in the neighborhoods that are not hit as hard as downtown properties. And because of those investments, because of that expansion, our commercial real property is doing better, a lot better than it would have if we were still solar aligned. So I always want to put that sort of silver lining on things um, because um, it's you know it's great for the vitality of the city to have all of this new development, but it also helps with our Good morning. Metro buses all have cameras on them. Okay, so what is that going to be used for, and how much people expect to collect from ticketing uh, by Metro buses having cameras and ticketing vehicles like the city? And with a lot of people from Maryland and Virginia coming to the city, are you sure you will get funding or funds from drivers who park in bus stops? No, uh, so yes, you are absolutely right. We don't have reciprocity agreements with Maryland and Virginia. Maryland and Virginia people um, uh, do not pay their tickets as much as they should. However, when we do our revenue estimates for um, revenues for bus cameras, red light cameras, stoplight cameras, all of those things, we factor in. Um, I, I don't know, I don't, do you remember what the percentage is? Well, we factor it in, realizing that we're not going to be getting a certain significant portion of the tickets that have been given out because 
they are given to Maryland and Virginia residents. Um, do you? So I don't know, and Heather, you may know more about this than I do, but the STEER Act was just passed. We do have to fund, some of it is not funded, but one of the elements of that is actually authorizing the Attorney General to pursue cases against folks who are in other jurisdictions who are not paying their tickets. And I don't know if that's- That's exactly what I was gonna say, okay. thank you. Yeah, and so we are hopeful that we'll be, I mean, the council is pursuing other avenues to try to capture Drivers who are uh, stopless. I, I think I saw something that in the first month uh, with the uh, Ambrose for the buses that there were what, like three million dollars of tickets issued in the first month alone. I don't know what the recovery rate is that, but it was pretty significant. So I'm. Um, that is giving me your phone before we go to another audience question. We can ask in the case, but. So for acts that have been passed by the council that cost money, can portions of the bill be enacted that do not cost the government? Yes. And so uh, what happens is when a bill comes and parts of it are subject to funding, we look at the other parts of the bill. Can some of those be implemented without those other pieces? If they rely on each other, though, so say it has se section 3B doesn't have a cost, but in order to do it, section 4B has to be funded. 3B can't go forward, even though it doesn't have a cost. So it's a it's a bit of an analysis and a and and, and a personal yeah, but we do pay attention to that and do that. And also, you saw, you saw that their bills with huge costs, right? But some of the pieces of those bills can be funded independent. And so we do that too. We might fund um, maybe there's uh, a, a large bill that is about home visiting, but we can fund the small part for first-time mothers, for example, is it visiting nurses for, for first-time mothers, or things like that, where we can break that provisions of the bill. Do I have any more? I don't I'm just... Um, my, um, sorry, my, my, um, my colleague here might have to leave soon, so she wanted to share in one brief minute her budget priority. Yes. She's going to speak in Spanish, and then I'll, I'll translate. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Mi nombre es Irma Zulde Morales, originaria de Guatemala, residente del Distrito de Colombia. Como proveedor de servicios de la primera instancia del Distrito de Colombia por 15 años, sirviendo al Distrito 5, mi compromiso como maestra se centra en el Distrito y el desarrollo integral de los niños. Solicito respetuosamente al concejal Padre que nos brinde su apoyo para preservar los salarios de los maestros. Es crucial contar con los 25 millones necesarios y evitar recortes, ya que esto garantiza la calidad y estabilidad de la educación de los niños durante esta etapa crucial de sus vidas. Su respaldo contribuirá significativamente al bienestar de la comunidad educativa y al futuro de nuestros pequeños estudiantes. Gracias. Thank you very much. And the translation, my name is Irma Sulde Morales, originally from Guatemala and a resident of the District of Columbia. As a provider of early childhood services in DC for 15 years, serving District 5, my commitment as a teacher is focused on the comprehensive development of children. I respectfully request Council Member Parker's support in preserving teacher salaries, no cuts to the pay equity fund, preserving the child subsidy, no cuts to the child subsidy. It's crucial to secure, in addition, 25 million additional dollars to the pay equity fund. So educators in early education, like Irma, can receive the equitable wages that the council has promised and they deserve. Lastly, your endorsement will significantly contribute to the well-being of the early educational community and the future of our young students. Thank you. We have time for two more questions, so we'll take your question and then they have a question from Minty and that will close out the q &A. Good afternoon. My name is John. So the commission of the five-year-old children. I have a question. I've got my curiosity. 
I want to talk about Stuart Paul and the budget career. And I've heard stories where uh, we're giving developers prime property for one dollar, like in Southwest. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we don't see any benefits, or what does the government see as a benefit return from that? Because after we do that, we now provide them with services which takes you know, our tax dollars for street sweeping and things of that nature around the development there. How does that benefit the DC government by doing those type of deals for one dollar and those developers end up making millions of dollars off of those properties? Sure. I'm, I'm happy to answer that. I, I mean, we have absolutely done a number of one dollar deals in the district. I'm not aware of any right now. Um, however, the the thought, the thinking behind it is that the district is paying for what it wants in return through the value of the land. So let's say the land is worth ten million dollars. Well, we give it to a developer for $1. Well, what are we getting in return? If the deal is negotiated properly, we should be getting uh, $10 million in benefits back through um, affordable housing, through uh, set-asides for uh, local retailers. Um, sometimes uh, we discount the value of the land because they're are a lot of environmental remediation um, going on. But I mean, you you are absolutely right um, with regard to the district giving away value and not getting enough back in return. Um, I think that council members are more cognizant of that now and have pushed back. I do know that um, with the those Florida the Florida Avenue properties, uh, Florida and U, that was district owned, and I believe that the deputy mayor's office at the time wanted it to go for a very low amount, but the council went out and we um, we paid for our own appraisals of the land taking into account the development program and push back and got a lot more money for those properties. And I think that if we do get dispositions um, that we feel are undervalued going forward, we will go down that same route again. One of the information that you're saying to us is not given to the public to say, we sell you this for one dollar, we project that we're going to see a two million dollar return in two years. We don't see any of that, so that means we don't know if any of that money is coming back in. That then we turn around and offer those developers services, put them in sidewalk, put them in traffic light, cleaning up outside their buildings and things like that. We are actually paying them as selling them the cheapest thing in the world, and that's land. And then we should be not be put in that dilemma and doing that and you know, allow a politician or the government itself to allow things like this to go unbidden to the community for people to see exactly what is transpiring in the community with our tax dollars. I see it right here, right outside of here, right across the street here. The dog of 18 years ago, sitting in this same room right here, telling us that you would give us a supermarket put the first building up. It is 18 years later. We do not have a supermarket. All we got is a fair say that the last time we got, we did a four different supermarkets to come back to the community. This is not fair to us when we allowed them to build all these developments in this city and now telling you there's shortfall for money. Where are their money from coming from? Their taxes being taxed for the people moving in. And one of the reasons that the individuals are low and tend to to the do is because of the cost. It cost you almost four thousand dollars to live in that building. Four thousand dollars. That's the price of a mortgage. And if anything, DC government should take, if you go pay that kind of money, let's get you into a program to get you into a home. Stop letting these developers take and dictate to our city 
and to our officials how they want the Senate to run. But we have a conclusion. I feel it in World War Seven, where again, seven, 17 years, you tell them government houses for a beautiful town house, right at the intersection of 15th and East Capitol. 17, 18 years. No damn supermodels. That's why they put more crime to come out their neighborhoods. You don't give them the things they need in their neighborhoods. Sorry. My bad. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your caption. Can you address that question? Uh, we're going to address this question, but uh, Commissioner Lockett, thank you for that. Uh, many people share your frustration with how the element has been run. I will say a few things just very quickly. There are legislative proposals to disrupt the cycle of throwing money at developers. One is social housing, introduced by Councilwoman uh, Lewis George. Uh, there is also a piece of legislation by Councilmember Robert White uh, that would uh, put a check on the government for selling land for a dollar. And something else that we're working on is co op or cooperative development. Uh, so that we can invest greater in communities and have greater accountability mechanisms uh, versus developers profiting. This isn't to say developers are all bad. They are interested in their bottom line, not in the vitality and the well-being of communities. I think that's fair to say. Um, two last things I will say, uh, you need a council person that's also holding developers accountable. Part of what I've been doing uh, both in a lot of the community conversations I've been having, whether it's about our divinity, whether it's about Providence, Macmillan, the list goes on, is educating neighbors about the process and how they can engage. Also, what's happening behind the scenes uh, is me making uh, requests of those developers of how are they going to invest directly in our communities? How are we going to ensure they follow up on their affordable housing uh, commitments, uh, their commitments for grocery stores and the like. Part of what has happened over time, I would suggest, is uh, there hasn't been a follow up, there hasn't been accountability. They say one thing, they get the keys, uh, and then no one's holding them accountable. Uh, there is a legislative fix, uh, but it's also an oversight requirement uh, that we're engaged in. We're going to take one more question, then we're going to go forward so that we can hear what are your uh, requests for our upcoming budget. So, should we do this? Uh, let's go to another question. I, I would just say here, um, it is a problem. DCPS routinely uh, cuts short the time that LSETs have to review budgets. That is a, an executive decision and function. Uh, it is not a matter of the budget. I would also say that's probably strategically done by DCPS to minimize the impact of the input and solicitation that L LSETs. Uh, can have. And so we will continue to push on that. I would encourage you to come uh, to the upcoming BCPS for the site hearing we'll schedule uh, in later February and we can get you that date. Uh, but one last question. Okay. My last question is about the Finally, is there anything in the Capture Vision Commission work that is being uh, considered to raise revenue? Absolutely. So the Capture Vision Commission, which uh, uh, meets once every two years. Uh, traditionally, the Town Commission Commission proposes uh, what's called a balanced proposal or a revenue neutral proposal, where the, um, all of the tax relief they propose, such as the child tax credit, um, is counterbalanced through uh, a series of revenue raising proposals. And they are they're considering a number of revenue raising proposals right now. We're looking at uh, changing the way we tax businesses. Uh, they are looking at mansion tax. They are looking at um, a digital, uh, digital information tax. So there will absolutely be revenue raisers in there that we can use to um, pay for the tax. So, just one quick thing before we go. Um, I was in the institution for um, five years or something, just across the road from Ward 5 in uh, Ward 6, just across the road out of Ward 5. But um, as people who 
we don't get to engage the community as much unless we get invited to these things. So thank you for inviting us. And thank you all for showing up on a Saturday morning yes. and caring about this. It's just it's super invigorating for us to see people engaged and want to know more about the process. And so thank you because the district is better when its people are speaking. So I, I just improved my Saturday and I just want to say thank you. The educator in me wants to bring people along in these processes, and I think that the education they provide is top notch um, because we need more Ward 5 neighbors at these hearings testifying, submitting requests. Uh, so here's my clue oversight hearings and budget hearings. Please sign up to testify. We can't make it down to the Wilson building, submit written testimony. It does matter. So when I'm on the day is make going to bat for work by priority and no other council member has heard a demand, yet they heard 100 people say they want X thing down the street, they tend to listen to the loudest voice in the room. So we need more work by neighbors uh, making a request for things in our community. Uh, we're going to transition uh, to uh, direct requests and what where you would want uh, uh, our budget uh, focused on. I just want to note that there were some questions that we did not get to. We will endeavor to get answers to those and submit them uh, back to the community. Also, a few things I, I was taking note of that I just want to reference before we move forward. Uh, be aware of false impressions. Uh, and by that meaning, it will come a time when the mayor will unveil her budget, and this isn't an offense attack on the mayor, but uh, you may see, oh, we're going to invest in City Park in this community. We're going to invest in this thing, and it never happens when it comes to pass. Uh, and that goes back to what I was saying earlier. We need accountability to ensure that we're actually following through on the things that we have said we're going to fund. Uh, last year, we uh, secured a million dollars from DDOT for improvements in South Dakota. We are actively fighting to get that money out the door. Uh, we secured uh, about $250,000 for opioid abatement in our Ivy City community. We had to fight to get the agency to get the money out the door. So securing the money is one thing, and then it takes oversight and engagement to ensure that it's used, because if it's not used, then the mayor, as she's compiling her budget for the subsequent year, can sweep all of that money and reuse it. And neighbors are still stuck on, well, hey, I thought we were going to have a park or a bush or whatever the case may be. So beware of false impressions. Also, I use the example of the school's first and budgeting process uh, introduced by Chairman Mendelson. Um, you may have heard the Deputy Mayor of Education uh, say, well, this is now undermining our public schools. Um, stay tuned to Jim and Ann and the council's office. Um, I would just say their spin on how the budget is reported out. Uh, the, the legislation, schools first and budgeting, was meant to ensure that more money goes to schools versus central office at DCPS. And actually, schools, including New York 5, receive more money. The, the headline from the deputy mayor's office, the mayor's office, was that the council slash schools budget. The, the, in fact, what happened is that central office was cut. And when I say central office, I mean downtown on the first street. When school budgets were expanded, so on McKinley Tech, now as an, an assistant principal position, they otherwise wouldn't have been able to fund. So beware of false impressions. A few other things. Uh, we talked about financial pressures. We did not talk about migrants. Uh, I, we have to take care of uh, our DC values uh, dictate that we have to take care of our fellow men. Uh, I am glad that we are housing many of the migrants in Ward 5 along New York Avenue. However, that does put a financial pressure on the district anywhere from 10 to 20 million dollars, or I'm sorry, uh, roughly seven to 10 million dollars a month. You don't hear the mayor talking about it a lot, but it is a financial strain on the budget that we then have to figure out how to address. Um, there are a few ways that we are going to plug the budget deficits that we have. One way is through new revenue streams, and that could be new taxes, that could be new uh, enhancements within the budget. I want to remind you of a fight that I led last year, and I was unsuccessful, but I, through an amendment in the budget process, sought to extend the D tax. The D tax 
is a financial transaction for uh, developers uh, and properties uh, uh, worth roughly $200 million or more. And uh, that deed tax sunsetted on September 31st, or this week, the end of fiscal year uh, 23. I uh, propose extending out that deed tax for future years so that we can use those additional revenues uh, for many of the programs that you're saying you want. I was unsuccessful. And again, I just use that as a plug that uh, we need more neighbors who are concerned about our fellow man, who are concerned about everyday Washingtonians benefiting from our budget to make their voice heard. Um, I also think we need to evaluate previously passed legislation. So there are bills that have been passed that come with hefty price tags. $50 million, $70 million, and, and my colleagues with great intentions will often tout these bills. Uh, we should, uh, given our budget shortfalls, go back, look at bills with hefty price tags, and ask the question, are Washingtonians benefiting from this today? And is it worth a $60 million investment? I will just put that out there. I do have opinions about certain pieces of legislation that cost 50, 60, 70 plus million dollars. Uh, that I don't think uh, is the best use of money. Uh, and then the last thing is uh, the tax revision and commission's work. Uh, every, roughly every 10 years or so, the tax revision commission uh, comes together or is appointed. Uh, the Chairman Mendelson appointed the commission. Uh, they have um, just about concluded their work. Um, and it is up to the chairman whether or not he will enact their proposals. Uh, worry is the chairman is not willing to enact the tax revision commissions, or it's not to say it's all for not, uh, because what the commission did was they identified worthwhile policy proposals like the child tax credit, uh, like a version of a wealth tax. Uh, uh, the chairman's mark even included a business um, activity tax. Uh, they've also identified revenue raisers. Uh, those are things that we are likely to see come up in the budget. Uh, but if you were questioning what happens next with the tax revision work, think of it as a proposal. Um, and now it's up to the chairman and the council whether or not we enact those things. Um, and the question still remains uh, whether we will do that. So just wanted to throw those things out. Now we're going to switch gears to how we want to see uh, the budget used. Um, what district programs, agencies, or resources have had the greatest positive impact on you, your family, and your neighbors. If you could share uh, your responses. What district programs, agencies, or resources have had the greatest impact? And for those who just joined us, you can go to menti.com and MTI.com and use the code at the top 57634013. All right, uh, building more bus and bike lanes, extension of the MBT to Fort Cotton, EPR, ERAP, Safer Street Supporting Vision Zero, Public Schools and Their Programs, Capital Bike Share, Summer Job Program, Langley Elementary has been an incredible community for my family. Uh, Shout out to the Langley family. Uh, parks and playgrounds, DPR. This is helpful to see. Uh, what district facilities, programs, or agencies can benefit most from more investment? We are going to break a little bit. So I'm going to ask that people uh, share your responses here, and then maybe we can call them one or two people to just share out. Link the elementary school, housing, VDOT, VOB, more housing inspectors, youth programs. Where should we spend more money in the district? Oversight agencies that reduce bureaucracy. Our rec center facilities and programs, uh, office and neighborhood safety and engagement, allow private towing to enhance the Maryland Virginia cars. Lots of tickets. 
BOES, BCPS programs for actual job preparation, senior public safety program, Bunker Hill, White Mosley, North Mission Park, Turkey Thicket, uh, Edgewood, Rack. Make sure it's open longer. Housing for pregnant people. Um, can we go up? Uh, for the job preparation, they include who here, or maybe it's somebody virtually. Uh, if somebody can get uh, them a mic, I'm just going to say briefly, if you could just expound on that for 30 seconds or less. Um, I also would plug that I did introduce legislation to establish a ward by business center. Uh, we are still waiting on a hearing for that, but the goal there would, uh, is for us to have a hub where people can go to learn, receive support, be connected to resources, and ultimately can uh, drive economic development. Around. But yes, can you share more? Yes, thank you so much, Councilman Marker. I'm Diane Turner, um, and um, I'm a, 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 a resident of Ward 5 and also participate uh, on the Ward 5 Leadership Council. Yes. I'm also one of the co creators of the Black Voting Gap, in which you want to participate. One of the big gaps, and you spoke to this little Black Voting Gap, yes. is to make sure that we address uh, the inequities, the social inequities, the economic inequities, uh, and that is one of the new problems. And I don't think it takes uh, you know a, a big research program to figure that out. That is driving some of this crimes. The anger, the, uh, the fear of the attack, and I'm a psychologist also. So, so I understand how this affected people feel when they feel hopeful and they don't see opportunities. So that's why I'm um, addressing this issue that we uh, really divert and redirect some of our resources um, to to actually prepare people for this yes. um uh, the jobs that actually can lead to uh, economic uh, stabilization. Right. Uh, giving people hope. And really, I think, and here's another thing that I have not seen addressed in any place, but maybe I have just listed, is really getting to the parents of these 12 and 13 year olds who are out here in the middle of the night committing crimes because that's where really they truly are. You know, they need, but most likely, they're, they, they are disaffected themselves. That's why these kids feel the need to get out here and supplement their family's incomes or to, or in that they're so angry. So it's a, it's a, it's a more, I it's not a simple concept. It's not a simple It's not a simple I realize that. And I'm mean, working the school system myself for 15 years. I, I get out of them. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. I'm going to ask one more person to share. Whoever may have said DDI, what can, can you expand on that? Uh, but in response to that, um, I think it's both government responsibility, but we also need public private partnerships. Uh, one of the things I've been doing with the development teams, as well as MedStar, and I look forward to sharing more information soon, is requesting that they invest directly. In our community through job training and apprenticeship programs, we just met with DOES yesterday, uh, focused on establishing a Ward 5 focus apprenticeship program. Uh, I could not agree more about the need for job training and development. Um, and so I hope to share more about that. So, Adida, who may have said uh, we need to invest more in Adida? And can you just expound for 30 seconds or less? Okay, nobody? No takers? Okay, uh, Lockie, you said do that. You said do that. Okay, uh, I'm gonna come here. I'm trying to diversify the voices, and then we're gonna keep going. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sushana. Um, I did say do that, but I think it's quite to anything to see um, because I think a lot of the issues we're seeing with do that could be from. Understaffing, shortage of staff, um, and this whole new TSI system that they have with the prioritizing supposedly 200 uh, requests. Um, I would just want to know more information from data about their staffing and, and why it is that it seems that, for example, signs, simple street signs take one year, two years, three years, four years to literally put in a parking sign. I don't understand what that is. And they will always say, we have one person who makes signs. That's literally the answer yep. for four years for me, and yeah, that's a little strange. I think you, uh, I see a lot of hit nights. I would say, uh, 
part of my frustration um, is that I think some of the change through DI in many of our agencies is simply too slow. Um, so that resonates. I'm going to keep us moving, but keep sharing your thoughts. What district agency or program should be cut if we need funding for other priorities? So there will come a time when we need to think about what to cut. All right. Make no cuts. <laughs> and to the whoever said none, I, I, I do want to say that is a valid response uh, in that some disagree with the assertion that we have to cut, and they would argue there are opportunities for us to simply raise revenue. And so there, that is a valid response. D dot. DCPS central offices, MPB never any housing, food health programs. MPB. I mean, on the top MPB, uh, we still spend over half a million dollars on our police force, uh, which is a significant investment. Uh, we are also paying a significant amount in police overtime. Uh, as you know, we have a staffing shortage at MPB, uh, and by shortage meaning uh, uh, we have fewer officers than uh, we had years before and that the mayor and many would argue we need, roughly 500 or so, uh, which uh, equates to the amount of money we're spending in overtime. That's important to know. Uh, the attrition issue, I want to underscore this is not connected to the funding. In fact, we last year gave MPB every dollar that they requested. Uh, the attrition issue is that they are finding it hard to attract and retain officers, and that they are losing officers faster than they can return. Um, but still, many believe that we should cut the MPB budget. If you had hundred dollars to spend on housing in the district, how would you spend it? So. Uh, ranking uh, with your investment between funding the long-term development of affordable housing, emergency rental assistance to households at risk of eviction, tax abatement for housing downtown, helping low-income residents buy their first home, vouchers to help households secure housing now, uh, tax abatements for housing and ward buy. Fascinating. It seems the majority are going for funding the long term development of affordable housing vouchers to help house, hold secure housing now, helping low income residents buy their first home. Um, one interesting tidbit we recently had a hearing on the social housing proposal, and the developers there said at our current rate, it would take nearly 100 years for us to build enough affordable housing for those that need it in the district. Put differently, we will never, at our current approach, with our current approach, meet the demand for affordable housing. And it begs the question: Do we have the courage to do something different? What's going on out there? All right, we're going to keep going. How can we better support seniors through our budget? All right, uh, if you identify or know or love a senior, make some noise. <laughs> can we better support seniors through our budget. break up my voice here. Uh, I'm going to ask a couple of people to expound on something right here. So housing, simplifying things, coordinating existing programs, social contact programs, social wellness programs, tax abatements, keep them in their homes, pay them to help mentor and support our youth health and safety, estate planning assistance, really important. So anybody want to expound on something they wrote, maybe somebody that we haven't heard from today. Yes, Mr. Jackson. Who I think was 
one of the two that, that lived in were 530 was. Yes, 530 is since 1947. Nice, nice. So, um, I appreciate what you're doing now, especially you and your team. I love the energy. Uh, I love to uh, see how we're going to fix things as opposed to talking about it. Um, so, I'm 70 years old now. I'm pretty healthy. I, you know, relative to living my age. So the things that really concern me, because I've never been 70. Never been 70. So I'm wondering what it's like to be a senior citizen and to have an older brother that you have to take care of. It's a lot of work. Yes. So the more services and things that you can do with our healthcare system and our professionals who are trained to be able to educate seniors how to take care of themselves, exercise programs, facilities, those kind of things are extremely important to me. I just got a car that I had been riding in for like the last three years. And it has all these gadgets in it. It's like trying to drive in the city now is crazy. Mm -hmm. So there needs to be good transportation, parking for people who have something they're taking care of. You gotta go to hospitals, you gotta go to checkups, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. We have to get around. Uh, and so transportation is important. And when people say, oh, you don't want to have cars in these areas, have you ever tried to take a 90 year old person to some place where they have to go and you have to take them there? This is a challenge. So I, I just think we need to think more about the seniors. We have a lot of seniors in yeah. this city. That's all I have to say. And we're blessed to have uh, seniors. We're going to take one more and then we'll keep moving. Uh, but what I'm hearing is wellness programs, health services, uh, as well as transportation for seniors. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Drew Simpson, and uh, we'll have you some time to even up with that chair. Um, but I'd like to make a comment about um, seniors. So at one point, there used to be, I've heard this like a million times before, like Theodore Hagen's was really committed to seniors, lots of programs, lots of activities. And one of the things that the seniors really enjoyed and was really knock on my door about is the fact that the pillars no longer are going to be. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure what switched up there and how that changed. But those of you that live directly across the street, they want that pool. They want it in the community. Did you just consent with an idea that seniors want programs only in the world? But these seniors want swimming and relaxation, six, seven, eight, nine o'clock in the Yes. Okay. We have heard loud and clear about the pool uh, issue, and we are uh, engaging in PR. So thank you. Um, if you had $100 to spend on economic development, what would you spend it on? Options include supporting community-run grocery stores to eliminate food deserts, tax abatements to get longer grocers to open in food deserts, uh, larger grocers to open food deserts, helping workers start and maintain their own cooperative businesses, investing in a basic income for those with children in poverty, investing in improvements to Capital One Arena to stop large corporations from like leaving. Seems like the larger group here is uh, investing in a basic income for those with children in poverty uh, and supporting a community run grocery store to eliminate food deserts. Uh, one thing I would say about a basic income, um, some might characterize our child tax credit proposal as a version of a basic income, although it's not fully. Uh, but there was a great uh, op ed or story in the Washington Post recently this week about the district's pilot program giving a basic income uh, to moms in wards five, seven, and eight, and the great success of that program. Uh, a great myth is that if you give people money, they're gonna misuse that money and go buy uh, things they shouldn't buy, let's say. Uh, but with that story in the Washington Post, and I encourage you to check it out, it makes clear is families, when they got these funds, used it on rent and food, and it allowed them to have a peace of mind to be able to take care of the family. How can we better support district youth through our budget? And while you're answering that, one more tidbit on the basic income. Uh, many 
data shows that many people support the policy through concept. But the minute you say the words guaranteed basic income and support for it drops drastically. Similarly, many people support policies that would provide support for low income residents. But the minute you call it social welfare, the support for it drops drastically. Just interesting. All right, how can we better support district youth through our budget? So we talked about seniors, now we're thinking about youth. I'm going to ask one or two people to elaborate here. All right, better school facilities, for instance, Langdon Elementary, uh, robust after school programs, expanding DPR programs, which for summer have a lottery because they are so popular. Fix and improve DPR facilities, enable more after school programs in more places. Farming, negotiating, uh, negotiation training, create programs to expose you to positive options and enrichment. Anybody want to uh, elaborate on something you suggested here? Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shanika Smith. I am Langdon Elementary School uh, PTO president. So I'm going to keep my name on the slide. And I just wanted to bring to your attention that Langdon Elementary is a ward high school, and they are a multi year recipient of um, the Bold Improvement Award, which means that. Throughout DCPS as a whole, um, every year they take their part in their exam, and Langdon has historically shown that they're able to educate um, average students, students as a whole better than um, most schools in DCPS. So they do it every year, and Langdon Elementary is one of the schools that have the most have received this award uh, for the past like, 25 years. Um, and this last year, even though we talked about the influx of um, migrants, in Ward 5, most of those students went to Langdon Elementary School. So they had over 100 more students um, just last year. I don't know what the number is now, but they, they come like literally every week you would see new kids in the class that spoke no English. And the teachers with that stream were still able to educate those kids enough that they were still able to get on that list to say that they're educating these kids um, better than other schools um, in DC for that population. However, the facility at LinkedIn is not the best. The HVAC system has multi-units multi, multi, multi in it, and apparently to renovate that system completely to make it warm when it's supposed to be a cold, when it's supposed to be, would cost as much as um, the cost to renovate the school. Um, LinkedIn on the had a half modernization before they can do a complete renovation, so the renovation is just not sufficient. So our act is to make the school let let's 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 let's, yes, yes. let's make the school um stand on what DCPS says it's gonna stand on for equity, starting with making sure the classrooms have proper heating and cooling. Um and so we did get a little budget capital to do a small improvement on the HVAC, but what that looks like is what I would argue um, to say, okay, well, we give you we gave you money for it, but what does that look like when you yes. have multiple systems? Um, and you got that capital budget improvement because our office fought for it. And yes. so we completely agree that students at Langdon, just like at Langley and Burroughs, and all of our DCPS students deserve to be educated in the state of art facilities. One thing in consideration uh, DCPS makes is Langdon is in queue for modernization. Um, and is it worth uh, investing hundreds of millions of, of dollars for an HVAC system if they are going to just tear the school down in a few years. I'm of the mind our students today deserve state-of-the-art facilities, and so doing what is necessary. Uh, and I, would like to, one more, I would just like to just be put up on the, so we're on the, um, we want a confirmation that we'll get that renovation. We have to have it confirmed for 2029, and that's as well as we can, so we would like that. And then one more thing, very basic. We have a hard keyboard. It has a derogatory sign on it. We've been asking for that our keyboard to be replaced. It's not usable. It's not. Um, it's not friendly. There's a Native American sign on there. It's, it doesn't work. And it's a very small ask. And I feel like we've been asking for many, many years, and we would like to see that push. 
Taking away or replacing the marquee. Replacing it. Got it. Thank you for that. Uh, maybe one more person. Uh, okay, we'll do two. Uh, let's come here. Uh, we go Brown and then uh, young lady in the back. And we'll keep with it. Thank you. Good morning. Um, Israel Brown, uh, work for my resident for three years. He's DC native. Uh, I actually uh, work um, at the Human Technology High School, even though it's, it's, it's physically housed and we will provide a service students in the the city. The Kinley has some pretty amazing programs going through there. Yes. Most of our work with the students are doing. And uh, I don't know how old the building is, but it's falling apart. And particularly the, um, the space where the engineering students are, are working with on projects where they're connected with NASA, the NASA space program. There's no, there's no, there's no heat in the building. Uh, so that's my thing. But what we've done you know, is start an organization to teach students about entrepreneurship. These students are working in the Engineering Academy, the Biotechnology Academy, and the Information Technology Academy. And they're working with innovative and, and inventive um, widgets and things. And, and nobody knows about it, but we need to support that because if we can show kids how to build a business around their in inventions and innovations, yes. um, they can hire people from the community and reduce poverty. So that's really the goal of this organization is to make sure that we're exposing kids to the, the opportunity to create um, to create businesses around okay. what they're doing. And I hear you loud and clear, McKinley is one of our flagship schools and we should be investing in it more. Uh, the lady in the brown coat in the back and then we're gonna keep moving. Uh, Carol and I, I will come to you. Uh, if you wouldn't mind after the next slide, I'll come to you. And then uh, we have a few more and then we'll close. Yes. And you know, many of our students were behind before COVID, once COVID came and they got four days. Yes. And I think many of them feel hopeless, and that's why they're running around because they possibly can't take care of My recommendation is instead of opening the rec centers in the evening to play basketball, we should have two. I would mm -hmm. like to see that we invest money. Or two in the evening to help the uh, young people catch up. Love that. Uh, great suggestion. We, over the last few years, spent a lot of money on tutoring. It was school based. So, okay. what's interesting about your proposal is anchoring it around our rec centers and libraries. Uh, let's go to the next. If you had $100 to improve road safety in Ward 5, how would you spend it? Uh, and then, Sam, we'll come to Carol. So uh, options include redesign the biggest and most dangerous streets like Rhode Island Avenue, pursue faster and cheaper safety projects on neighborhood corridors like Franklin Street, uh, beautify residential alleys, a repair of broken sidewalks. Okay, that was easy. Um, the largest share here is redesign the biggest and most dangerous streets like Rhode Island Avenue. Ward 5 has many major thoroughfares cutting through it, including North Capitol and Michigan and Rhode Island. Many of them are South Dakota. Many of them are um, filled with cars from Maryland and Virginia zooming through our communities. One thing I would say about Rhode Island Avenue, we have a new uh, deputy mayor for economic development, uh, Nina Albert, who lives in Rhode Island, by the way. Um, and I have put the redesign of Rhode Island as a major focus for my work with her over the years to come. I'm happy to hear and say uh, that she sees that as a great opportunity. So it's great that our new deputy mayor uh, sees a, the redesign of a dangerous thoroughfare like Rhode Island Avenue. As a need of this. Uh, Caroline, what are you and then we'll go to the next slide. Okay, thanks. Uh, my name is Caroline Petty, and I chair the uh, Housing and Land Use Committee for yes. the Ward 5 Leadership Council. And I just want to go back to uh, housing issues, yes. if you don't mind. Um, we, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we met as a committee and we strategized about the year ahead, and we identified a set of a small set of priorities in the housing area that we hope that we'll, we'll be willing to focus on. Um, some of them are legislative and probably don't involve budget, but a couple of them are budget related. Um, the first one in the legislative category is we think that there are some simple changes 
to the inclusionary zoning law that exists now. Inclusionary zoning is, is an affordable housing program. Yes. You know, some simple changes that would open the door and um, legalize, if you will, kind of make it clear um, that it's uh, legal uh, to senior more senior housing um, and also um, more um, the ability to negotiate for deeper affordability, more housing, senior housing, more uh, affordable housing set asides in connection with zoning actions. So, but I think it requires a legislative fix. Okay. That would be simple and we think non controversial. Um, second thing is um, the, uh, um, th this one is more of a, of a budget issue. Um, we're, we're asking for a study um, of the possibility of what we call co living, which may be um, uh, connect well with the co op um, idea. Yeah. I don't know. But when we talk about co living, we're talking about arrangements where people get together, a group of people, small or large, get together, um, have private bedroom or sleeping rooms, so, but they share expenses, share common space. That hasn't been looked at much in the District of Columbia, uh, but it does exist. Uh, many cities across the country are, are exploring it. And so we're asking for a study that would be done by DHCD okay. in connection with the uh, Department of Community Living and Aging. So I'm going to ask if Paul could uh, send these recommendations in writing. Yes. And what we could do is set up a time to meet. Uh, but what I appreciate about the recommendations is the innovative nature uh that it's pointing to but because again we know our current approach is not working and what i would offer you is that there are many in the city that know what we're doing isn't working but would say let's just keep doing it because it's the only way forward and i push back and reject that there are different ways and so thank you for that okay let me just two last things uh one thing and maybe okay, so two last thing and that is um we want to thank you for your support for janice lewis george's uh, Green New Deal for housing bills, yes. and the committee stands right up for that. And that is the social housing proposal. Correct. Yes. Thank yes. you. Absolutely. And for those that may not be familiar, the concept generally at a very high level is that if you build a complex, a uh, part of that complex would be uh, market rate uh, with uh, some units uh, rented at a subsidized level, uh, but that the government helps fund. Uh, the rent and the development of that project. Any surplus funding from it goes back to the government that would then go to another uh, building. Um, and this goes on. Um, please respond to the following statements based on your agreement. Investing in youth employment out of school time programs and family services is violence prevention. The district does enough to ensure that families are housed and have enough to eat. I support raising revenue, especially for households that have a lot of to ensure everyone's basic needs are met. On that last one, it, it, it's interesting that everybody, well, not everybody, but it seems like the vast majority of people here agree with that last proposal. That is something on the table. You may have heard it as a mansion tax or a property tax or a uh, differently is a wealth tax, but there is a debate around, do you tax properties at a certain value and over? Some may say a million dollars, $2 million, $3 million, what have you, uh, to help fund some programs. All right, keep going. What would describe how you feel about DC as we enter this budget process? All right, go. Ahead. I believe this is our last question. What word describes how you feel about DC as we enter the budget process? Hopeful, optimistic, good, overwhelmed, troubled, demoralized, hopeful because of you. Thank you. Thank you. That's not good. Not hopeful, angry, unsafe, prepared. Ready for wealth tax, managed by the rich. Uh, the largest words are hopeful and optimistic, which means more people are saying those words. Um, and I'm going to end this there. 
Um, and I am optimistic about the future of the district. We have very serious challenges facing DC. Many of them we talked about today. Violence is top of mind for all of us. Uh, but as I hopefully uh, made clear is that uh, we're trending in the right direction. Um, and what I would ask of you as you leave here today is to stay in touch with us, share your feedback, come testify before the council, continue to make government work for you uh, because we are fighting tirelessly on our community. Thank you for engaging today. If you haven't already, we would encourage you to complete our budget survey. We do have paper forms uh, here. Uh, but we also encourage you to uh, take the online version. Um, and members of my team will be here. I will stick around for a little bit. Uh, and thank you all for those watching. Thank you.